I would be willing to bet that you are making at least one of these overland or off-road mistakes. The reason that I say that is because, well, these were the mistakes that I made when I first started overlanding and off-roading. In fact, uh, you know what? Leave a comment below and let me know if you did any of these mistakes or am I the only idiot that did this? For this mistake, all we need is 30 seconds to get the point across. Well, you just broke your truck. Uh, you brought your tools, right? Yeah, of course. Got them right here. We're gonna die. Okay, so you get the point of this mistake. Make sure you bring adequate tools to service your vehicle if you break down on the side of the road or on the side of a trail. If at all possible, you wanna avoid being towed just because you don't have a wrench or a socket that you need. At the very minimum, I would carry a set like this as well as a secondary bag. Okay, and don't forget to bring a full complement of fluids for your vehicle. On every trip I've ever been to Baja, I've had at least half the fluids that I brought get used. Ironically, I've never had to use any of them for my vehicle, but it's always been other people borrowing them. We've had people break radiator hoses, brake lines, all kinds of things on the trail. Uh, where they needed the right fluids to kind of get running again, and it's kind of critical to have that stuff. Nerf bars go where you would normally find rock sliders, but they have Nerf bars instead. Nerf bars are essentially fake rock sliders. They're rock sliders that can't actually support the weight of your vehicle crashing down on a rock. A lot of times they have steps, and they give you a very false sense of security. Let me just give you an example of what I mean. I am the worst spotter on earth. I was looking at your rear tire. See, when it comes to protecting your actual vehicle, Nerf bars are next to useless. And if you are off-roading and you are spending money on getting oversized tires and lifting your vehicle and all these things to get better clearance, it makes no sense to be putting a step that immediately removes that clearance. So one of the main reasons I say that these are a costly mistake is A, they cost about many times half as much as getting a set of real rock sliders would. It's depressing how many sets of Nerf bars I see on Jeep Wranglers. They're everywhere. But some people aren't using their vehicles to off-road. Some people just want them to look like off-roaders. So a lot of those have Nerf bars. If you plan on off-roading your vehicle, do not get Nerf bars. Get something like this behind me that I'm pointing to. These are rock sliders. You're going to notice with rock sliders that A, they're a lot higher up. Their main purpose is not actually to be a step, it's to actually protect your car and be able to drop the full weight of your vehicle onto a rock. Now these are a huge deal. It's not just about protection. These actually increase the ability of your vehicle. There's really sharp turns with tons of rocks and boulders that this vehicle is basically almost too big to get through. And I have had to use the rock sliders on rocks as pivot points to turn the vehicle kind of bending it through uh, tight knit spaces. And you know, sure, the bottom of these gets scratched up. You need to take a little WD-40 and sandpaper to it every once in a while and uh, repaint it, reprimer it. But um, these are incredible at protecting your vehicle. And this is what you actually need if you're trying to protect your doors and be able to add that capability level. You notice I lose almost no clearance whatsoever from these. All right, so the bottom line is if you are taking your overlanding and off-roading seriously, don't play around with Nerf bars. Get actual rock sliders for your vehicle. Uh, one thing I will tell you that's very confusing, if you get the new, let's say the new Raptor Bronco or even a Ford Raptor, which is kind of supposed to be this ultimate off-road package, they actually come with Nerf bars from the factory that look deceivingly a lot like rock sliders. They will not protect your vehicle. They will bend right in half the second you drop them on a rock. Um, they are a joke, you should remove them, and you should get some actual real rock sliders. And yes, if you want to make fun of me, feel free to go at it. I actually owned a 4Runner that had Nerf bars on it. I had a 2-year-old and a 3-year-old at the time, and of course we were using them as steps, 
like many people do. But I'll tell you this, if you end up on a true, true off-road trail out there and you have Nerf bars, I hate to say this, but everybody around you knows that you don't know what you're doing. Okay, hold on to your hats. We're headed out into the wilds of suburbia. I gotta go return a couple things to the hardware store and I guarantee you that while we are driving there, we will be able to see at least a couple of these mistakes to avoid. That's how common these are. Don't do these things. Try not to get run over. Oh. Forgot the stuff I was gonna return at the hardware store. There goes a Bronco. Not really messing up. And followed quickly by another Jeep. There's one particular build mistake that I'm looking for. We're gonna call it the white whale because you don't see it nearly as often out driving around in the wild of suburbia. But I'll bet that we can find one today. Come on, white whale. I know you're out here somewhere. Oh, this guy's got stickers for days. I'm sitting here in the parking lot eating Panda Express, you know, to look after my health. And I spotted the white whale. He's right over there at the light. He's turning in. Now I gotta go find where he's gonna park. We got him, we got him, got him. Ho, oh, Editor Nathan here. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, please consider subscribing. I would really like to continue to make videos for you guys and not go back to a tech job. And maybe if you stick around long enough, I'll show you what's in the secret door. Yeah, that one right there. Anyhow, back to the video. Poor guy. Seriously, I'm not picking on you. I'm not trying to be mean. Just trying to educate. Okay, here we go. This is the white whale in its natural habitat. So this, my friends, is what we call the, what would it be? The WTT RTT? The way too tall rooftop tent? Let me explain. When you're off-roading, ideally, you want a low center of gravity. This is not conducive to a low center of gravity. Now, I don't want to pick on this guy. Maybe he's picking up a fridge today and he needs it that high, but if you're driving around every day and going off-roading or even rock crawling with your tent like this, this is a terrible idea. It's bad for gas mileage. It's bad for weight distribution. It makes it a lot easier to roll. It makes it a lot worse to drive on the freeway through bends because your car will have a lot more roll. Um, it's just not a really good idea in any way, shape or form. And yes, I absolutely ran a tent way too tall when I first got one myself. Guilty. Ah. Why does every TRD in this parking lot have Nerf bars? It's just a sad thing to see. It hurts my soul. I've got a Hummer with Nerf bars. That's exciting. Oh, Nerfs. But on a van. So I'll allow it. Okay, right, so earlier this year, I filmed this short. Do you know what this is? This is a D-ring shackle. Do you know why I have so many of them? It's because I keep finding them in the middle of the road on trails. Don't make this common overland mistake. No matter how tight your D-ring is, it only takes a couple miles of the perfect washboard to vibrate it loose and send it down the trail and into my pack. Now, actually, thank you. I have a lot of them now, but I really don't need any more. Okay, so tip number one, consider keeping them in your recovery bag and only pulling them out when you actually need them. If you just can't quite handle the idea of not having color match D-rings all over your vehicle, then I would at least recommend getting some with cotter pins because these will not fall out. Also, get ones with rubberized tips so they won't take the paint off your bumper. Well, a lot of you are kind enough to point out that it can also be called a bow shackle, but even more of you suggested ways to permanently attach it to your vehicle, which is kind of missing the point of the video. See, the thing about a bow shackle is that you need to be able to remove it to utilize it in a recovery. So you don't want to lock tight the thing or zip tie it to your vehicle. You want to store it inside your vehicle, inside of a recovery bag, so you don't lose it on the trail and you have it when you need it. Did you know that if you loop a recovery strap through a bow shackle because you can't take it off your vehicle, uh, it actually removes strength 
Many times that means that it no longer has enough strength to be used in recovery for a full-size truck. You want to be able to take that pin out and attach the strap the way that it was intended to be used for maximum security and so you don't end up in the hospital. Hospital visits are even more expensive than losing bow shackles on the trail. Okay, so I think this might be the most important mistake that we're gonna cover in today's video. This is an automatic transmission, and this is a Tundra, uh, but this is true in a lot of vehicles. With an automatic transmission, when you're driving off-road and you're driving in particularly loose soil, so think when you're off-roading in the sand dunes or when you're driving in deep, loose dirt on loose trails. Um, also, it definitely comes into play in mud. Uh, if you're mud bogging or driving in really slippery clay, you do not want to leave your automatic in automatic mode, just shifting it into drive and saying, go for it and let the, let the car decide. What will typically happen if you do that is your car will begin to overheat itself. And the reason being that when your tires are loose like that and are spinning a lot, the car keeps trying to search for the optimal gear, or at least the transmission, tries to keep searching for the optimal gear for your car to be in. The problem is with spinning tires, it constantly keeps thinking it needs to go high and then it drops down low. And what will end up happening is your transmission will begin to overheat. Now, there's a dummy light on your car that comes on when your transmission is way too hot. By the time that that comes on in almost every make out there, you've already ruined your transmission fluid. There's uh, these substances within your transmission fluid that make it, it's like the active ingredient in medicine. It's what makes them actually work. And by the time you're in that 250, 300 degree range for your transmission, you have completely cooked that. And eventually your dummy light is gonna come on and make you aware of that. Your dummy light is coming on, by the way, usually right around the time of that your transmission is overheating so badly that it is going to begin to start overheating your engine. To where at that point, if you continue to drive your vehicle the same way, you will likely overheat your engine. And if you're driving something like not a Tundra, but maybe more like a Ford Raptor, you'll end up warping your engine and having to buy a new engine. Don't ask me how I know that. Anyhow, moving on. Here's what you wanna do. With these trucks, you're gonna shift it down to drive. You flop it over in this model, and now you're in manual mode. Depending on the train that you're driving in, pick a gear that works for the majority of the time, and then you can just stay in it. So it's not searching for gears, and it's not overheating your vehicle. Um, I tend, like in sand dunes, when I'm gonna go climb really steep dunes, I actually tend to keep it in second gear and I let the, I actually let the RPMs get a little bit high, but I don't want it, I don't want it to automatically be trying to shift into a higher gear, right? When you're about to crest a really tall sand dune, then you just get stuck, you bog down and then you gotta back down a really tall sand dune while sliding backwards, which is very scary. So don't put yourself in that situation. Learn how to use manual mode on your transmission. Save your transmission. Just because you've never had to do this doesn't mean that your transmission hasn't run hot when you've been off-roading in sand. I've been with multiple people. I've been with a Tundra and Sand Hollow that overheated their transmission very badly, actually. Kept having to pull over after that until they figured out to drive in manual mode. Um, I've seen it happen with multiple um, Raptors. One thing that's interesting about the Raptor is everybody's like, yeah, the Raptor's made for this stuff. And that's kind of true. Has a very delicate engine. It's uh, literally what the mechanics at the Ford dealerships will tell you. Um, super delicate engine. So you wanna be careful not to overheat it. But the thing that's funny about the Raptor is it has manual mode, just like this, but then it has the little dials for all your other modes, like Baja mode. So people take them to Baja on our trips and they stick them in Baja mode and they think, well, oh, that means I'm fine. Then I don't have to worry about it. And it's not true. You will still run into the same issues in that slippery sand and slippery soil. It may change gears a little bit less than having it just in straight drive, but you still can overheat it. That one that I was talking about overheated in Baja mode. So those kind of modes are, they're just a different tuning for your car. They're not, they're still, they still can't compete with you using your actual brain and listening to your engine and paying attention to what is really going on. So learn how to drive in manual mode. Okay, if you're new to driving your vehicle and you're like, I can't really 
listen to the RPMs very well and I'm not really sure what's going on. And maybe your car doesn't even have the gauges to be able to tell you some of this stuff because not everything has an RPM gauge anymore. So if that's the case, there's these great tools called a scan gauge. Um, it's the one that I use. There's tons of them out there. You can use whatever one you want. They plug into the port right down here on the bottom of like under your steering wheel. It's called an OBD2. It's the same port that they use to do your emissions testing on a vehicle. It'll plug in right here. I run a cable up the side and I end up with this nice little gauge over here that I'll show you. And on that thing, I can actually program four different gauges that I can pick from. So I could pick the engine RPMs. I can pick the transmission temperature, which is fantastic. So when I'm off-roading, I know that when I get to about 220 degrees on my transmission, I should be paying attention. And if I forget to shift into manual mode, because I think, yeah, my tires aren't really slipping around that much, I always keep an eye on my transmission temperature over there. And if it starts to get too high, I realize that ah, it's doing more work than I think that it is. And I start to drive it in manual mode and I pick my gear shifts accordingly. And it does very good. And right away, you will notice if you do it correctly, that your transmission temperature will start to come down. So don't fry your transmission fluid. And especially don't, if you ever do fry your transmission fluid from driving an auto on sand and, and you do get the idiot light, the first thing you should be doing after that is going home and getting your transmission fluid replaced because it's basically useless at that point. There you go. The more you know, the more you know that rainbow thing. Da -da -ding 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 -ding.